Thank you, Felice, for that lovely introduction. And um, thanks to all of you for being here early on a Saturday morning. We appreciate it. Um, I am uh, pleased and thrilled to be here talking with Maya Garnet um, in honor of her exhibition, Maya Garnet Dream This Gateway, um, which I think, as hopefully you will stay and see, um, is a absolutely transformative, exquisite, ecstatic um, series of works. Um, Mariah is a Los Angeles-based artist and filmmaker, uh, and we have been working on this project for uh, about two and a half years now, and it's taken different shapes. But I'm enormously pleased to be here to talk about this work um, and to have Mariah share uh, her own sort of thinking through these works. Um, Mariah traditionally works between and across documentary and experimental modes of filmmaking. Um, I think one of the uh, things I'm really interested in is the way you sort of travel um, uh, notions of what a documentary, the sort of objective nature of doctor documentary is filmmaking. Um, and, you know, in, within that, I think um, you have quite um, uh, nicely talked about the way you conceive of your films as a portrait um, of uh, or honoring a conversation between yourself and your subjects. Um, and I think we really see that in the works we have uh, on view today. Um, so I thought maybe we could start um, just talking about your practice in, in general as a filmmaker and um, uh, how you engage with your subjects, what the research into um, you know the different individuals and histories um, that you navigate, you know, where that comes from, how it takes shape. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thank you, thanks for coming um, in the morning. Um, so yeah, I think just sort of general introduction to what I do. Um, the, one of the things I'm always thinking about is the sort of power dynamic that's inherent in filmmaking. So like there's the director and the subject and a lot of the language around how that power dynamic is set up between who's behind the camera and who's on camera um, reflects that. So I, I think in a lot of my films, I'm trying to kind of undermine that power dynamic or play with it or put it on the screen. Um, and to do that, I usually will cycle through a bunch of different like modes of filmmaking. So <clears throat> you'll see this in trouble um, uh, if you go <laughs> on the 23rd at Aurora Cinema. I just keep plugging it. Um, that film you'll see like um, sort of narrative stage narrative reenactments that were obviously shot on a nice camera with a camera crew, um, paired with like iPhone footage, paired with talking heads interviews. So I like to sort of like keep you on your toes as a viewer watching it and constantly kind of remind you that this is a constructed and subjective um, document that it's not. It's not like a true story about a person because I think that's a truer reflection of history um, or like capturing history or experience to the only way I think it actually makes any sense is to acknowledge that it's like a subjective experience. Um, so I'm always trying to do that with all of my work. Um, and usually I figure pretty prominently in the works too, like I'm on screen a lot of the time. Uh, one thing I do that I think kind of pushes me out of the documentary realm is that I, I will often play my subjects. So I'll like dress up as the person I'm making a film about and embody them and try to like understand them in a physical way, um, which I don't think I've seen other documentary filmmakers do. <laughs> um, uh, which I haven't gotten there yet with this body of work. Um, my image is notably absent in this body of work, um, which is kind of uh, a, uh, a characteristic, not characteristic of, of my work. Um, but I think another th another thing about my work is I often start with sort of really small focus explorations of an idea, um, usually involving me dressing up like someone. <laughs> um, but I like to sort of like play with uh, the idea of spectacle and the idea of document and kind of try to like pair those two things together in a film. So usually I'll start with spectacle or fetish or something that's like very focused on one small element and usually involves reenactment um, or embodiment of a text and you can see that happening in this work. Um, so for my feature film Trouble, 
the way I started it was to reenact a, a 10 minute documentary that the BBC made about my dad in 1971. Um, and I played him in the, in the reenactment. And so the first piece of that film, which eventually like kind of explodes outward to look at like the entire history of the conflict through like a really specific lens and sort of track his movements um, through the conflict in Northern Ireland in the 70s. Um, I started with like a really focused sort of like uh, video installation. Basically, it was a two channel video installation. Um, so I think one of, channel was your reenactment, and on the other channel was the original recording. Right? Yeah, it was a private footage, um, which I did not buy the rights to. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, I did for the feature film, but um, not for the installation. So um, this body of work, I it, it I think it like looks a lot different in a lot of ways than the film, the you know my previous work, but I do think that there is. A sim it's like a similar process where I'm starting with this material and I kind of think of like doc my documentary subjects as being either like written material or people or certain histories like it doesn't have to be a person that I'm telling a story about in fact it shouldn't be someone that I'm telling a story about um, so I'm starting with this archive of materials and kind of trying to find a way into it and bring some of it embody some of it and see play with it and sort of see how it functions um, in culture right now. Um, and then yeah. that archive is, you know, in its first instance related to um, the life of your great great aunt, as yeah. Elise mentioned, Ruth Linda Dale, yeah. um, and began really with your encounter with the diaries, um, as well as the, um, uh, the Diadema Stars, which is a yet to be produced opera. Um, but can you talk about a little bit how you found or encountered that and you know what made you want to dive into this history? Yeah. Oh I will also say part of my work like putting myself on screen and, and the way that I make films and think about artwork is like what is my relationship to the material and I'm always trying to put that in the film. So it's not always a family relationship but I have used family a lot like in 2010 I made a reenactment of a Fassbender, a, a couple scenes from a Fassbender play with my half-sister that I had never really hung out with before, playing opposite me, and, um, you know, I made a film about a gay porn star called Peter Berlin, and so there's no, like, family relation there, but then there's, like, other ideas of relationship and family, so, um, yeah, the films, all the projects are about relationships, and right now I'm kind of trying to parse out, like, which relationships are important to me. Um, because actually the family one is sort of the least important um, to me. <laughs> uh, not necessarily like, you know, objectively least important, but in, in producing these works, my relationship to my family member, my dead family member I've never met, um, is like the least exciting or impactful or transformative relationship that I have in, this, in making this work. Um, so how I found it, it wasn't really like a discovery, it was something I've always known about. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so she, the woman whose archive that we're using, or I'm using as sort of like the foundation or jumping off point for these works, is my, my maternal grandmother's aunt. Um, so she lived in Cairo from 1924 to 1960. Uh, she was born in the, at the end of the 19th century and um, was kind of a musical prodigy and a touring pianist um, and composer. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, when she was in middle age, so they around 40, she moved to Cairo and lived out the second half of her life there. Um, and when she died in 1960, she sent back like a couple trunks of her stuff, and it was all her diaries and all of her orchestration and plans for this opera that was never made, um, and this stone, the ancient stone head, um, and and some like prototypes for musical instruments and costumes and stuff. So everything that she shipped back was like related to this body of work that wasn't really ever realized. Um, and I think like everyone since that like package of materials arrived, everyone in my family has kind of tried to do something with it. And um, either like like I know my my her brother, my grandmother's father, tried to get Franco Zeffirelli to make a movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And his his rendition of Romeo and Juliet was like one of my favorite films as a young child, and it like really informed my sexuality. <laughs> um, and like I made all my my friends at a sleepover party watch that movie when we were like in sixth grade, and it's like. I don't think watch this. <laughs> um, but that's a tangent. Um, yeah, so, and I think my mom, you know, my mom in the 60s, like, were some of the, like, prototype materials. Um, so I had the costumes. Costumes, yeah. Um, like, there was some, like, caftan robe thing, whatever that she wore in the 60s. Um, there was, like, some costume jewelry, too. But, um, yeah, so there's always been some kind of, like, engagement. On, the, on my family level with this material. And I, I will say, like, I haven't been interested in my mom's side of the family making work about my mom's side of the family because I'm very close to them. I was interested in making work about my dad's side of the family because I didn't meet him until I was 27. Um, so a lot of my work is like finding out about something that I don't really know a lot about and kind of like bringing the audience along uh, to learn about this thing through me. Um, so I've been very like, I don't want, you know, like, I know these people, I know these histories, like, they're too close, I don't want to make anything out of it. Um, but I did, I mean, I don't know, a couple years ago, maybe like five years ago, towards the end of my finishing this body of work about my dad, I started thinking about this opera and these diaries and just became kind of interested in it, um, partially because I met Brianna St. Clair, who's the star of the video in there, um, The Soprano. Um, she was an undergrad at Cal Arts in music school while I was there for grad school and film school, and I saw her perform a few times, and she was just like amazing. And I kind of witnessed her transition, both like, you know, uh, gender transition and vocal transition a little bit, because um, I think she was like 18 when I met her. Um, so, you know, I just, I sometimes the way I work is like I'll have two things I'm interested in and just want to put them together, but I knew Nefertiti was like a, a starring role in this opera and I talked to her about it and she was like, yeah, that'd be great. Like, you know, she's like, I'm an opera singer, I want to play queen, you know? Um, so, yeah, I think that was kind of like the starting point and then when I started to like look a little closer, like I knew I knew the story of the diaries that, that Ruth was like um, living in Egypt and believed she was, um, talking to ancient spirits and like possibly a re reincarnated ancient Egyptian spirit and kind of wrote this opera in collaboration with them. And that's something I've always kind of like rolled my eyes at. It's a little bit of a, a cliche, um, like Agatha Christie era romantic. Um, in fact, there's, I can't remember her name, but there's someone who owned something. It's a German woman that went to, um, she was a Wikipedia page, but um, she's a German woman who went, who was like worked as a, cleaning woman or something and then went to uh, Egypt and began talking to spirits and then, you know, like the exchange rate allowed her to live this like fabulous life that she probably couldn't um, in Europe. So I, there's like this sort of problematic cliche um, <sighs> associated to her story that I has made me like not interested in making it, but right now I'm seeing all this stuff about spirituality and and sort of like finding things in our contemporary moment that are reflected in some of the stuff I'm finding in her diaries, um, both like in terms of the problems and just like general culture. Like you'll see those things outside the, on the wall, the uh, little lists um, with the drawings. She, those were things taken from her diary and I almost feel like they could be like Instagram self-help wisdom. Um, so like this is a, like I'm always looking for these like resonances and when I'm working on a document that's historical and I'm seeing that in her diaries, which is kind of what made me become interested in it. Also like these conversations about uh, cultural appropriation and reparations. Um, I became interested in kind of like where this fits in, uh, in those conversations, like where this archive might fit in those conversations. Um, and I think we talked a lot about like what you do with an archive like this and how how to acknowledge its um, uh, very specific um, nature, the ways that it sort of privileged certain ideas of ancient Egypt over then contemporary Egyptian culture, um, the way that, you know, it, it, both the way it um, 
relates to a kind of contemporary rhetoric around self-help and our conversations around mental health and spirituality. Yeah. Um, but what was really interesting to me, and I think something um, that I find that your work does, is this kind of understanding an archive and the potential of an archive to be um, uh, ever-growing and not a kind of static thing, in fact, and not the way we conceive of like an archive as um, something relegated to the past that um, is self-contained, but the way you might um, uh, problematize that and um, grow it. So um, in addition to all of Ruth's materials, you're also building an archive, you're adding to this archive, whether that's um, through uh, your own engagement with the medium when you were in Cairo, um, whether that's your own diary entries, as well as, I'd say, um, all the works here, mm -hmm. um, that they sort of add to this existing archive, um, yeah. which I'm, I'm really interested in, um, and like how you think of it as sort of like an open, I mean, is that how you're thinking about it? Like as something that you're adding to, and like what, what does that additive element do? How does it, ref is it an act of reframing, or? I'd say it's more like responding to this archive and like transforming it or something. I don't necessarily mean like adding to that. Um, I, one other resonance culturally that I just remembered um, was that she was writing at the time, at this time between world wars, where everything, like the world felt like it was apocalyptic and like we were on the brink of total destruction. And, and her solution was like to turn to spirituality. And I feel like that's like a major cultural shift that I've been seeing over the last couple of years is like this turn towards you know, non-Western, um, sort of more esoteric or, you know, astrology, all these different sort of like spiritual um, crutches, I guess, <laughs> in the face of like in the destruction now is happening. So I, I saw that resonance too. Um, but your question about adding to an archive or responding to an archive, right? Is that the last one? It may have not made very much sense, but I'm just interested that, you know, when you think about, like, archives are constructed, they're, they're built, you know, yeah. they are not neutral, and yeah. um, I'm, I think I'm interested in the ways that one way of responding to that might be opening it up rather than yeah. leaving it closed, and so, you know, what that kind yeah. of additive, whether it's not, I, mean, I understand that you don't necessarily feel that it's additive, but um, maybe more responsive, yeah. I guess. Yeah, it's totally. totally. Um, yeah, I mean, I think of like, you know, history. I, one thing I'm thinking about with this work is like the way history is written and who has written it. And, um, you know, just like trying to acknowledge the, that, I don't know, like in terms of my documentary practice, I feel like there's this relationship to the way I think about history and subjectivity and objectivity and not, not really believing in objectivity. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a preciousness around archives of like treating it like an important physical material. Like I actually have a vocal score, like an original vocal score and a couple of original diaries just in my garage that I'm just like touching all the time, <laughs> you know, and flipping through and like some, I'm kind of damaging some of them and I'm okay with, you know, I think that that's, that's what's the value of an archive if it's like locked up somewhere you can't look at it. Um, and what's the value of history without like thinking about how it relates to right now? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there's like there's like a preservative mode or conservator conservative idea of what history is and what its importance is, and which I don't ascribe to. I you know I think it's it's important. It's only really important the way it resonates right now. Um, and I also I don't know. This is like a little woo, -woo but I kind of think about. Um, about time travel a lot and how like we're constantly time traveling as as human beings um, and how we have this these capacities to like live in other dimensions um, while we're also embodied here right now um, and you see that in like the production of art and uh, the consumption of art and like everybody's capable of like sitting down and like being in the upside down and Stranger Things you know like that's like a human trade um so i mean what that has to do with history i don't i mean like it, even history is that you know you read whatever textbook you have to read and you like are suddenly in on the same Dina the pinto on the santa maria or whatever um, <laughs> so 
yeah, I like to think about it like how can we how can we take that out of like the things that uh, force it into a box and just like embody it and bring it into now. And to recognize that it's been written by somebody with right. biases and it reflects a very specific, not universal idea of, you know, what history, yeah. you know, that it that doesn't fall from the sky. Yeah. And I think that's what's one thing that's really interesting is again like the way um, you're sort of looking into other forms of knowledge or other narratives that could have been that the work that um, Ruth's diary doesn't necessarily address, but using yeah. it as a prompt. Um, you know, I think that um, we've talked about this a lot, but um, you know, Ruth was hearing the voices of multiple spirits and struggled with her own mental health. Um, and then, uh, you know, that um, her response was an inward turn, yeah. you know. And one thing I think that you've been interested or that the work sort of um, does quite um, neatly is that it sort of shifts that and moves into this sort of like, okay, well, what would this look to like, um, for this to be sort of an outward facing project? And mm -hmm. I guess to some extent that um, is done through collaboration, um, which I think is, I, I imagine that you've thought about your works as collaborations in the past, but there's something quite specific about yeah. the way that you're literally collaborating with other, other artists um, and in the moment sort of giving over authorship in certain ways. And so thinking through not only what this archive means to you, but what say Colin Andrews or um, Brianna Sinclair or Christopher Paul Craig, what, what these documents mean to them and yeah. using them and um, you know, a kind of collaboratively um, a collaborative mode of, of producing. And I wish, I, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that specifically in relationship to, to this body of work. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, generally speaking, like what I was saying before about trying to sort of subvert these power dynamics between, like, director and subject um, is at play here, but it's it's pushed a bit further. I mean, I've never, I mean, I've worked with other artists, but, like, more making a documentary portrait of another artist and that's an important. Um, but this this work, it's like I have I haven't like made new material with other people really ever. Like I've always sort of been me looking at another person and like acknowledging that it's me looking at another person and then you know unpacking what that means and what that relationship is. Whereas these works, I'm like working with very. Um, uh, talented and established and capable artists um, and you know I'm yeah I'm not really used to like directing performers or um, other artists and telling them what to do and I'm not really interested in that I'm more interested in looking at what they're capable of and how they work um, but I have had to like step into that role a little bit particularly with, with that project um, Holland is like a very self-contained um, performer, and like I think that was one of the things that I was really interested in is they create these universes of sound, just like the four little pedals and two microphones. And Holland is the um, uh, performer you see in this multi-channel um, video that you're sitting with it with no sound right now. So please come back when the sound is on. <laughs> um, so I think I just wanted to like watch them do that um, and just sort of draw out the parts that seemed. Um, that sort of like reflected that the capacity that I saw in, in them as a performer. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, in terms of the way of problematizing this archive and working with these artists, like most of the my collaborators are artists of color, um, you know, either Black American artists or uh, Egyptian artists and I think like what I'm trying to do with these artists is kind of ask like what do you need and how can I give it to you and like what is valuable to you as performers um, and like potential descendants from the people that Ruth was sort of appropriating in her work um, like yeah what is the value of you, to you in this um, and it's very different for every single person that I've talked to so it's like a very like, you know, usually most of my work is just me and one other person, um, but this work is me engaged with a bunch of different people. Um, I don't know, I'm just trying to, I'm still finding my way through it, but um, 
trying to like find ways to like generate something of value in this work in a contemporary political framework that, you know, that makes sense and is supportive and generative to the people I'm working with. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's also something um, about this uh, collaborative aspect of, of your work and specifically these works um, on view that also has to do with you know, creating a kind of multiplicity of voices and narratives. And so um, even within a single work, and you'll see that when this work is turned on in the way that um, Holland's voice overlaps, um, has a kind of moments of like sort of ecstatic chaos overlapping, um, you know, uh, crescendos of, of vocal intonations that clash, mm -hmm. um, that echo at the same time simultaneously. Um, I think we see that in the power of life is love through um, this rock that has a sort of chorus of AI generated voices um, with uh, the sound piece that's over here. I was just a boy. Um, there's a kind of collage of sound um, overlapping of a historical song by Munira Al-Mahibia. Al-Mahibia. Yeah, the yeah. yeah, the composer who I worked with uh, on that piece is an Egyptian composer and um she yeah like what was of value to her was looking at these two time periods that were happening simultaneously in egypt one with uh, an egyptian singer and one with like a white composer and like putting their work together and finding like the places where they align um and also like but also dissonance like and the also dissonance, dissonance yeah them. i feel like dissonance there's also a lot of um very much like sonic dissonance, yeah. but also an understanding of you know what it means to mesh together or to try to mesh together these two um, time periods, um, thinking through the ways that yes, there are parallels yeah. in sort of political, um, cultural concerns happening, yeah. um, as well as a real relevance to thinking about colonialism in this in this moment. Um, uh, but there's, you know, I, it's it's just so fascinating to, um, at least for me, to think about um, the ways that you are really sort of um, thinking about um, multiplicity and um, other narratives and um, both exquisitely, beautifully, and lyrically, and then maybe in the power of life is love, there's something really campy about the scene in which there's a rock on stage on a plinth. Um, uh, you know, speaking in this sort of flowery, um, very purple prose um, uh, about, you know, success and validation, which I think are, as you said, like this sort of narrative of self-help, which is so relevant right now. Yeah. Um, I just thought of an answer to a much earlier question that you asked. <laughs> Go for it. It was about archives and history and thinking about history. Um, I like. I think one of my just sort of like personal political relationship to that um, question, or, or like how do we relate to sort of dominant culture, which is what is archived, um, and just like as a queer person, as a woman, as a gender ambivalent person, like um, <clears throat> most of the movies and books and images that I consume, like are problematic <laughs> to me or produced by people who don't like me <laughs> you know, or like <laughs> don't think that I should exist in, in my current incarnation. Um, and so like I feel, or you know, I was raised in the 80s, so or I grew up in the 80s, so it was a lot more um, present as a child. Um, so I mean, I think anyone whose identity is like somewhat marginal or deviant to like what dominant culture tells you you should be like has developed this this skill which is like enjoying something while constantly while simultaneously knowing that the person who produced it might like wish harm upon you um so i think like um that has i don't know so like reclaiming histories and archives um is just something that we do innately uh, most of us like there's very few people that actually align exactly with the picture of what dominant culture tells us or it did in the 80s <laughs> um, of what was you know truly 100 percent like fits these sort of like binary ideas of what um, people are supposed to be like um 
So I think that's part of like what I think about in relationship to history is like how we're constantly doing that anyway, like complicating everything that we consume um, and we do it innately um, if our identities are at all, you know, off the straight and narrow. Um, yeah, and then back to this question of collaboration. I think one thing, when I picked up these diaries and like learned about, or it was like, I don't know, starting to read them, like they're, here, I'll read you one. I, there's some excerpts from her diaries in here. Um, this is a song book that Mariah made that contains fragments from the diaries, fragments from uh, Mariah's own journals while in Cairo, um, conversation uh, interview with Brianna Sapphire and Chris, um, as well as other songs that are incorporated in um, some of the works on page. Yeah, and it kind of it's like it starts with the sound piece, so there's a translation of the Arabic song that you hear in that sound piece, and then kind of goes arc back around. But like this is this archive is bonkers. It's like not you know the need. I don't know why I'm using Christopher Columbus. It's like you know 1492 sailed the ocean blue. But like my the way that I was raised with history, like this is a crazy archive. Um, and I actually probably should use that word because I think she actually suffered from probably a serious mental illness. Um, but like this is the way that I, I really love this excerpt um, where she says. The vile stories of archaeologists have aroused much anger among gods, and these men will be punished for their misuse of their authority. This is largely the reason the other mummies have been remo removed from the museum. Their spirits got weary of being dissected by stupid people, and they dislike Mrs. Brunton's portraits of themselves intensely. <laughs> um, so, like, that's kind of like the most straightforward like story in the archives. In her archives, like. For feedback and feeding back a little bit for the speaker. Um, and like this is this is actually the text that uh, one of the movements of this piece is responding to is in, uh, uh, what's it called? Improvisation. Um, vision of the creative source of life. I felt myself suddenly in the midst of a gigantic white pulsing light, which is the source of life. This has a power so overwhelming that it never ceases in its activity. There is a movement in it, a quick rippling movement, as constantly the terrific energy is discharged in space and reaches its appointed place. From this creative fire, the 40,000 images of Tashra are formed. That's a spirit that she talked to. Um, this is the purpose. This is for the purpose of making thought take form in order to further create forms. And then she has all these things about like how if you think about money enough, like it will materialize, like you know, deal, deal with the alchemy and stuff. So, like, I think that's one of the things that I'm interested in this uh, particular archive is it's really wacky on the one hand and like really off course, but she's also like married to a guy who works at the British Embassy and is like drawing doodles of the British pound and like is like super, like, super invested in ideas of monarchy and like royal dynasties and stuff like that. The so spirits like, tell her she will rule one day. Yeah, yeah the spirits no. are always like, you know. You yeah. will be rich, she will rule. Um, it's go, a, go say these words at the pyramids at midnight and like adorable women and they'll have a pilot. You treasure. will find the very treasure. Yeah. Um, I am interested though in, you know, you shared some um, fragments from the latest diaries with me. And one thing that was really fascinating to me is this kind of um, Ruth as a medium and as a medium that's hearing multiple spirits. Mm -hmm. So it's not a single person or entity talking to her, it's always multiple. Sometimes it's Jesus Christ, sometimes it's Truth Common, sometimes it's some, a spirit she calls Ta, but I think Ta is also itself multiple. Or, um, and there was something, um, I don't know, and I, I am not queer, but there's some, there was something that seemed inherently queer about this idea of being embodied by, by multiple spirits. Um, and there was, um, <laughs> it's true. Um, and there was, you know, I, I just, the, this idea of being um, channeling, of yeah. um, being occupied by multiple beings at the, at the same time. Um, there was something really prescient about it as well. Um, and I wonder if that was something that like you were surprised by in reading through the, the narrative, um, as much as there are these problematic elements, like yes, yeah. being told that she will rule and that she will find buried treasure, which is probably quite literal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, but I don't know. I, I was fascinated. Like I never thought about the idea of like 
what it meant to be a, a medium as something inherently queer before, but um, I don't know. Yeah, I think like, yeah, I actually haven't thought about it in those terms specifically so much, but that's kind of one of the things I was wanting to in the piece in that one is like the, the scene from the opera that I chose is these two like royal characters singing about how much they love each other, but the way that they're talking about it is like our spirits are lent to earthly frames. And it's all this, it's a song about how their spirits like met on this other plane and like desire each other in essentially like outer space. <laughs> um, and then the second half of that where you see the rock talking um, is uh, a, a collection of excerpts from her diaries where the spirit is telling her like, I'm looking for a body. It's like this very intense longing, like he keeps talking about how much he longs to be with her. Um, so there's all this like unrequited longing of spirits like across space and time that can't be together embodied, which I think is a very like historically queer thing, like the, you know, it's a desire that is, well, at this point, requitable, but um, for a long time, like not requitable in the way that it is now. Um, so yeah, there was something reflective in, in the, the way that the desire is written um that resonated with me as somehow queer even though she probably probably like sitting over there and screaming i mean <laughs> that's not true right now but um but yeah and also like in terms of channeling in this piece like i have never really worked with musicians before up close like this and like witnessed their process and talked about like where sound comes from and um just like how they do what they do which the closer I am to it, the more mystifying it becomes. And I think that they're all mediums channeling spirits, like every time they open their mouth and sing a note. Um, and the more that I've talked to all of the artists involved in the show, like they've all had like, you know, at least some kind of like synesthesia experience. Um, uh, and like on the most extreme end, like actually talk to spirits. So I don't know. I, I'm kind of, I'm sort of interested in this idea of like, what is a spirit um, and like how it's connected to art making and, or art consumption and like thinking about what I was saying earlier about like being able to simultaneously um, inhabit different spaces and, and times in one like human um, body. Um, so, yeah. And I, I think that work does this, like you really are seeking or there's a sense that there's a, a bridging between past and present, um, working across space and time, um, you know, whether that's being sung about in um, the scene from Ruth's opera that we see Brown and Chris um, uh, singing, um, whether that's through Holland, who is uh, quite literally intoning, singing um, fragments from Ruth's diaries, uh, fragments from your uh, engagement with a, a medium while in Cairo, as well as other songs. And so there, I think it's, um, you, you're sort of literally bridging those those moments, or as much, not literally, but um, you're, you're in the works are very much spanning these, these moments of time, obviously with the sound collage and its mixing of a, um, you know, 1920s um, sort of anti, um, uh, British occupation anthem, anti-colonial anthem. Um, you know, I think that there's a, a, a way in which um, you can really feel that in in the work, and um, you know, both bringing, as as we've said, sort of like bringing these two temporal moments to think about together to think about similarities, but also um, radical differences. Mm -hmm. um, and in a lot of ways, I feel like um, this body of work is a, is a kind of offering. Um, which I think is what I meant before by an addition, mm -hmm. is that, you know, it's an offering of another way, another way into this archive, through this archive that focuses less on um, Ruth and the sort of fetishistic implications of, of her work mm -hmm. um, and more on um, the questions regarding the intersections of like spirituality, art making, mental illness, otherness, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, 
uh, marginalization, you know, I, I mean, yeah. um, yes, there are these problematic aspects about Ruth, but, you know, you've talked about how she was, like, the institutionalized, and she's, like, eternally kind of, like, seeking yeah. solace, and, you know, in the diary, you can very much sense that this is a, you know, a woman on the, like, edge of dissolution, yeah. um, and really trying to um, keep herself together and what I also like about the works is that you let things go to pieces you let things fall apart particularly in um in I think this work with with Holland yeah I mean I will say like you know I think part of what is resonating with me just from the archive or like you know the words that I'm responding to in the diaries and in the opera has to do with like the point that I am in my career right now as a 42 year old um and you know, kind of entering the mid-career phase of my um, of my career, and all of the fears that come along with that, um, and and like something I've been thinking about a lot prior, especially over COVID too, like a lot prior to really digging into this was like, how do I keep making art? <laughs> you know, like both financially and like ener energetically, spiritually. Like, where do I find the support? to do this like internally and externally um because you know after i graduate grad school there's all like you know it's like doing new things and learning stuff is exciting and you know there's emerging artist grants and then you enter mid-career and it's like if you're not if you haven't like developed a, a majorly lucrative painting career it can be a little scary <laughs> So I think that was something that I was really responding to in, in her diaries is like these fears around not having, not being able to make work and, um, and like her solution being, you know, this spirit, this like uh, chorus of spirits that um, told her everything was going to be okay. Um, so yeah, I feel like that was, that was kind of like personally where I was connecting most with this work. And I think a lot of my collaborators were also um, connected on that level. Um, yeah, like how to how to self soothe, how to like keep going, um, and where that energy comes from. Um, I think everybody that that I was working with, uh, has, I mean, I don't want to speak for everybody that I was working with, but I think that's a that's a pretty common <laughs> condition of being an artist right now. Um, yeah, uncertainty. So. Um, I think maybe I have one more question for you, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Sure. But um, have you been thinking at all about, you know, one thing I love about um, the way we've been talking about this body of work throughout our relationship, not necessarily in this conversation, is um, uh, as a kind of ever-evolving project or mm -hmm. a project that would have multiple phases. And I think you you did that with um, Other and Father and Trouble mm -hmm. too, which is something that you're building out that you're continuing to work on. And I just wonder if you have already ideas of um, you know, the next phase or the next project in this body of work, whether you'll continue to think about this archive, expanding it, or um, yeah, what's next? I'm not entirely sure what's next. Um, a couple things I want to do, I want to get everybody that I worked with into a room together, because we've been <laughs> producing it over COVID and I haven't been able to do that, and I would like that room to be in Cairo. Um, so I would love to be able to bring everybody to Egypt and like visit the ancient sites and then also just like give them all space to you know do what musicians do together um and the other thing I'd like to do is this is sort of like I don't know when I was in Cairo I came up with this idea after watching um, a few mu musicians that I met there work together that I want to make a remake of Godard's um Sympathy for the Devil uh one plus one Sympathy for the Devil which is like a documentary of the Rolling Stones making that song, recording that song. Um, but sort of like what would a queer exceptional remake of that be? So I have like multiple different people making music, um, potentially make, you know, all using the same melody and doing our own interpretations of it, um, interspersed with sort of more political vignettes. Um, yeah, so I don't know. That's, those are the two things that are picking around in my head, but we'll see. <laughs> Yeah. Should we open it up to any questions from the audience? Yes. Ah. Great conversation. Thank you. Um, I uh, was wondering if you would please describe the the like composition of the song or songs that Holland was performing. 
-hmm. Yeah, so um, when this loop starts, you'll see there's like a minute and a half where none of the images are playing and you just hear them singing um, and they sing this melody and that melody is an aria from Ruth's opera. Um, but I took, I worked with a pianist and composer in LA to replace the lyrics of the opera and then in the songbook you'll find each lyric set that I used. Um, so I think the first one that plays is, that's later in this book, I guess, but um, you did not want to be a woman in this last incarnation. You've been in a disturbed state of mind for some months. This is a reflection of psychic conditions on this earth. The earth is not in a normal state at the present time. Great changes are taking place to make way for immensely better conditions. America is sick and people do not know their own minds. So that's like from 1932 or something. Um, so that's like one set of song lyrics. Um, and then as these screens start to come on, Holland is singing five different sets of lyrics to that same melody. Um, and the other lyric sets, there's two from Ruth's Diaries, two from this accidental session I had with a medium in Cairo. <laughs> Every time you're like this accidental session yeah. I happen to have with a medium. Well, it makes a difference because it's, like, it's not like I went to Egypt and was like looking for a psychic, you know, uh, or even looking to talk to Ruth. Like I went there to work with the specific collaborators. Um, and to me, it's important that I was like kept being drawn back to her. And, and especially in a specific way that it was like this friend who was like, oh, I'm developing my psychic abilities and like, let's go over to my friend's house. And, and then had this like crazy hour and a half long conversation with her um, that I was not expecting to have. Uh, so two of, the, two of the songs are from a transcript of that session. Um, and they are kind of more dealing with like some of her specific traumas that I learned about in that session. So like dealing with sexual assault and um, mental health. Uh, and then this screen has lyrics written by Raphael Corey, who's a, a playwright that I want to work with more. Uh, I've got a commission to write a couple songs for this show. Um, and that's like kind of using like Google directions because we spent all of our time in the car we could do all the lyrics. So we're just constantly driving around in Cairo. Um, and it's sort of talking about like all of the toxins in the Nile and, and how they've accumulated over the last uh, 6,000 years. Um, so yeah, so then, okay, so those all play at once. That's like what's happening here. And then as they all turn off, um, Holland has, takes those mel that melody and that set of lyrics and sort of destroys and reconfigures it uh, in these improvisational sets um, that they kind of created just on the spot. Um, so this is like them responding to these this melody and these lyrics that I gave them uh, and making something else out of them. Uh, so that's like the first two chunks of the piece. Then the third one is just one set of lyrics um, that Holland sings all the way through and then does their improvisatory breakdown of. Um, and the way that Holland makes these sounds is they have like, you'll see there's some, there's like two or three shots of it maybe in the whole thing, but uh, in, the, in the super wide shots, you'll see like a row, row of petals and wires and stuff on the floor and you'll notice they've got two microphones. The one on the left is just their voice, and the one on the right is their voice with all these effects. So they run like their voice. Oh, there you go. Let's see right now. So <laughs> when they're stepping on those pedals, oh, here comes the um, When they're stepping on those pedals, they're, they're putting effects on their voice, like analog in real time, and creating loops out of their own voice that turn into this chorus. So in the third part of this, I like edited the film to reflect the loops that they were making. So they'll make a sound and then repeat it, and I'll take the section of the film where they made the sound originally and just like have it jump around on different uh, screens. And then the final movement um, is when all five screens are on at once and playing the exact same thing. That is an improvisation that Holland did off a diary page. Um, you can actually see the diary of something in the background there. Um, 
on the table um, that they were responding to. So they just like flipped open to a page and made this composition based on that. Yeah. The melody comes from Ruth. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. It's Queen T's solo. <laughs> <laughs> and I picked it because I actually thought Holland was a mezzo soprano, but they're actually just a soprano soprano. So I picked one that was maybe a little bit slightly lower range. Um, but they adapted it to fit the voice. Um, but yeah, that's the only mezzo sopranos aria in the whole opera, which is what I picked up. And it's like really spooky sounding. <laughs> it's like very, it almost sounds like someone going like, Ooh, you know, it's like very ghosty sounding. So it was appropriate for, the, for this piece. Does anyone else have a question? Well, I encourage you to take one of these home or sit there and listen to the, yeah, it was designed to sit at the end of and listen and take a break from all the other things that you're going to listen to um, while you read it. Well, thank you all for coming and for um, being here so early in the morning. Uh, I hope if you haven't seen the exhibition already that you'll stay. Um, when we finish, as I said, the sound will go back on and it's a very different <laughs> experience. In fact, the works are very much about uh, sound and sonic dissonance and yeah. um, I encourage you to sit through it. And thank you, Mariah, for thank being you. here.